In 2004, in South Dakota, three amateur paleontologists discovered an ancient skull. Nobody could immediately tell what animal it belonged to, so the finding was handed over to the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, where it collected dust for two years. Despite all attempts to determine its owner, experts couldn't confirm the skull's relation to any known animal species. Young visitors of the museum named it Dracorix Hogwartsia because it looks very similar to a magical Harry Potter creature. Bizarre outgrowths on its skull fuel debates between scientists and make them wonder what kind of animal it really is, but most experts agree it's a baby animal. At the same time, judging by the size of the skull, the creature had to be at least three meters long. Just imagine how huge it was going to be as an adult. Furthermore, in 2017, a complete skeleton of a similar beast was found in China. Meanwhile, in Alaska, experts found one of its feathers. But the most unbelievable thing is that these animals quite possibly lived alongside our distant ancestors who even depicted them in art. Petroglyphs found in Canada and the US prove that. But what are these animals? Could they really have roamed the land a long time ago? There are already six videos dedicated to extinct animals on my channel, but I'm sure this is something you didn't expect to see. In Canada, experts found a petroglyph made by the indigenous tribe of the Anasazi over 2,000 years ago. It depicts a creature resembling a giant lizard. An image of a similar reptile was seen in the San Rafael Swell, Utah, only this time it had wings. That rock art was created by one of the indigenous tribes around 4,000 years ago. If you examine it closely, you'll notice that the creature on this petroglyph had an elongated head, massive membranous wings, and clawed feet, which makes it look like some unknown dinosaur species. On top of that, there are other findings indicating that ancient humans met such animals not just once or twice. For example, the Ica stones. In 1966, Dr. Javier Cabrera d'Arkea received an engraved stone as a gift from his friend. The motif of the stone was some type of an extinct fish. Since Cabrera had a keen interest in prehistoric items, he started searching for such stones and buying them. As a result, his collection came to number more than 15,000 pieces. Among other things, these stones depicted creatures fairly similar to dinosaurs. Moreover, on one of the stones, you can see a human sitting astride this animal. That is absolutely impossible because people appeared after dinosaurs had died out. Therefore, it had to be some other beings that looked like giant reptiles. The authenticity of these stones has been repeatedly questioned. Although collector Santiago Agurto Calvo reported that he personally found such artifacts during excavations around the city of Ica, according to him, he found two items in tombs erected by pre-Hispanic cultures. Besides, stories about lizard-like beasts that terrorized our ancestors are present in the folklore of many various nations. Mentions of giant long-tailed or even winged reptiles with large teeth can be found in myths all around the globe. Even the Bible slipped them in. When reading it, we learn that on the fifth day of creation, God made great sea beasts and flying creatures. The word used to denote these animals translates from Biblical Hebrew as a dragon. If we believe the sacred text, humans used to be their neighbors. Maybe they even boarded Noah's Ark and survived the flood. But references to dragons don't only appear in the Bible. Gilgamesh, a hero of ancient Babylonian mythology, killed an enormous dragon named Humbaba guarding the gate to the cedar forest. In an Anglo-Saxon epic poem, Beowulf ripped out Grendel's arm to get this dragon's claw. In the travels of Marco Polo by the famous explorer, you can find descriptions of long snakes with short clawed hands. However, if anyone gave dragons most of their attention, it must have been the Chinese. 
In this region, parts of reptiles' bodies were used as medicine or even food. As for European culture, it also has its share of dragon myths. In addition, you can often see these beasts used as heraldic symbols. But even though studying legends and ancient art is exciting, having actual physical evidence is a whole different thing. As you might guess, if folk tales were the only proof of the existence of dragons, I wouldn't be telling you all this. In 2017, residents of the Chinese village of Jiangjiakao stumbled upon a very peculiar thing in a field. That was the skeleton of an unknown animal, and nobody had any idea where it could come from. The thing reached 18 meters in length and consisted of many segments. It had two disproportionately small arms and a skull resembling that of a cow. Some superstitious villagers firmly believed they saw the remains of a real dragon. They were so scared to desecrate the thing that they didn't even dare touch the skeleton. The rest of the locals, however, didn't hesitate to straddle it and take photos. Zhang Jiakao officials made no comment on the discovery and didn't send the remains for scientific analysis. Eventually, everyone concluded that the skeleton was a movie prop, even though no one could tell what movie it was. The future fate of the finding is unknown because it just disappeared. And it would be the right decision to forget the whole story and agree it was just a prank if similar things weren't found in other parts of the world, too. In 2021, in the Australian state of Queensland, scientists unearthed an ancient skeleton fragment that belonged to a flying creature with a 7-meter wingspan and a meter-long skull. On top of that, both the upper and lower jaws contained 40 teeth. I bet you wouldn't fancy meeting this beast face to face. Archaeologists believe that the neck of this animal was incredibly long while the body was compact. Most likely, that was a rare species of flying reptile called Anangara. They lived about 112 million years ago and presumably fed on fish. In any case, their jaws were clearly made to catch prey. They were the first vertebrates that learned how to fly. And even though scientists suggest that Anangara inhabited all the continents, finding their remains is nearly impossible. Throughout all of history, archaeologists have discovered only skeleton fragments, mainly jaws. But the strangest and most interesting feature common to the species is a big palatal ridge on the upper and lower jaws. According to one version, those ridges helped Anangara maintain balance while flying. In addition, scientists admit that this feature really makes them very similar to mythical dragons. Furthermore, there's a finding serving as indirect proof that these animals could have existed at the same time as mammoths, and perhaps even humans. When John Reeves was working with another mammoth tusk around 10 years ago, he couldn't have predicted that he was about to find something that would overshadow everything he'd discovered before. This gold miner owns a parcel of land called the Boneyard. It's situated in Alaska, where, due to permafrost, remains of the Pleistocene fauna are preserved in pristine condition. The region's climate is favorable enough to let both bones and soft tissues survive through the eras. After mammoth tusks are extracted from the ground, they need to undergo restoration. The fossils are left to dry with hose clamps on so that they won't crack and deform. Unsuspecting, John was busy attaching clamps to yet another tusk that had been taken from a depth of around 20 meters, when suddenly something unbelievable happened. Right inside the tusk, the gold miner saw a blue feather. How could it have gotten there in the first place? Reeves was stunned beyond belief as he'd spent years building up his rare collection and had never encountered anything like that. He calls this feather the most remarkable item he's ever found. Although paleontologists say there were no birds with blue feathers in Alaska during the Ice Age. At the same time, John's treasure is so small that it can't even be carbon tested, as this procedure will simply turn the feather into dust. 
this little thing may be a key to unraveling the mystery of the creatures currently known only as folklore characters. But let's imagine that dragons did exist. How real could they be from a biological perspective? Could those giant reptiles do all the stuff they do in the legends? Chinese, Japanese, and ancient Greek myths described dragons as ferocious aquatic monsters. However, the largest underwater animals known to science are mammals. Whales, walruses, seals, and dolphins are born with the necessary set of biological attributes to be able to live in or near water. Dragons, in turn, are definitely not mammals. And judging by the folk tales and archaeological findings, they're much closer to dinosaurs. Plus, among different types of prehistoric lizards, there were also marine beasts. For example, Plesiosaurus. Its wide, barrel-shaped torso and smooth skin with no scales helped it easily maneuver through the ocean. Very long neck and a small head let the animal quietly approach fish, which see a threat only in big-sized objects. Thanks to its short tail and four flippers, this predator could almost fly underwater. When the Plesiosaurus fell off the radar, its place was taken by Mosasaurus. This carnivorous reptile also had a streamlined body but a larger head, short neck, and a mouth full of sharp teeth. Now this looks more dragonish. Mosasaurus didn't use its flippers while swimming. Instead, it moved in the water by beating its tail back and forth and curving its spine from side to side. Predators of this kind don't sneak behind their prey, but rather chase it and then attack. Therefore, water dragons don't contradict the laws of biology. But what about their winged relatives? Dragons described in various legends may seem too bulky to be able to fly, and yet there are documented examples of quite large animals that could take off to the sky. The biggest of them are called pterosaurs, whose wingspan reached 10 meters. The secret lies in the ratio of the creature's weight to the size of its wings. Pterosaurs could weigh up to 250 kilograms. Their bones were partly hollow and just a few millimeters thick. Apart from that, they were strengthened by internal struts, just like an airplane's wings. Since the bones were air-filled, they were flexible and lightweight. As for dragons, their wings could be filled with for instance, methane. This gas is lighter than air. That's why it would make even a creature more massive than a pterosaur capable of flying. If the structure of dragon bones was indeed comparable to that of large birds, this could be the main reason why we can't find their fossilized skeletons. The point is, porous bones decay before they fossilize. That may be why we still have no direct evidence of their existence. But what about dragons' trademark ability to spit fire? Could this be a real biological feature? You'd be surprised, but not only can such animals theoretically exist, but they already do, side by side with us. Bombardier beetles can release bursts of hot liquid from their pigodeal glands, located in the abdomen. The chemical compounds are stored in two reservoirs and a separate chamber where they're mixed. Dragon biology could work in a similar manner. It takes just one specific chemical reaction to start breathing fire. And it's not even the only way to get it done. Many animals, including humans, produce methane through anaerobic digestion. This gas is highly flammable, so instead of wasting it on useless burping, dragons could accumulate methane in internal reservoirs and, if necessary, unleash this potential with a more exciting purpose. But even though methane is so flammable, it needs to be ignited, doesn't it? But how? I doubt dragons were carrying around Zippos. But in fact, they could probably have something like lighters inside. Small silica and steel deposits on teeth would be enough to spark a fire. The lizard would need to snap its jaws one single time to release streams of blazing flames. But would this hurt the dragon itself? Saharan silver ants have a special tool for such cases, reflective bristles that cover their bodies like a metal suit. Thanks to this armor, 
ants can easily survive in an environment where temperatures rise to 70 degrees Celsius. And since fire-breathing dragons don't need to withstand heat from the flames all the time, this level of protection should be sufficient. This means that dragon anatomy doesn't conflict with the laws of biology either. Although, there's one catch. As a matter of fact, evolution always strives for simplicity. What's the point of creating such complex mechanisms and stuffing them all into one creature? None of them is an absolute must for survival, and their reliability is doubtful. Sharp claws and powerful jaws are more than enough for a successful hunt. As for self-defense, using long, strong tails as a weapon would do the trick. If born with a pair of wings, an animal may just spread them and fly away. That's why if dragons really existed, they would have died out very quickly and been replaced by more rational species. But anyway, let's imagine these legendary beasts were indeed real beings that survived all ice ages and mass extinctions and even avoided human violence. Would they be able to fit into our world? Since dragon myths can be found in all cultures, we can assume they lived all around the planet. They could probably have inhabited Earth at the same time as dinosaurs when all the continents were a single landmass. As time went by, lithospheric plates moved. That could separate descendants of the same species so they could wind up in absolutely different conditions. As a result, flying, aquatic, and terrestrial dragon species could have appeared. Most probably, these animals would have naturally evolved as well as the rest of the vertebrates. So it's idle to hope that someday you'll meet a dragon looking like those CGI things. Feathered dragons would have lost their ability to fly just like present-day large birds. Even though they would have still had porous bones, in the course of evolution, wings would have gradually become smaller until there were no wings at all. Unable to fly anymore, dragons would have had no choice but to leave the mountains and settle in the plains to find alternative food sources. Over time, they would have stopped hunting and started feeding on snails, worms, and fruit. Despite this, they would have still had muscular hind legs with claws and powerful beaks. Wait a minute, that totally sounds like a kiwi just several times bigger. Such dragons would definitely be welcome on farms as the eggs they'd lay could be even more impressive than those of ostriches. Now, let's see what could happen to their aquatic relatives. Evolution would have equipped water dragons with fins instead of legs, or maybe their habitat would have made them completely limbless. At some stage of their transformation, these dragons would have gotten scales and sleek bodies to be more agile while moving underwater. Most likely, they would have existed on a diet of fish and small crustaceans and lost the ability to breathe fire together with their limbs. Instead, these dragons would have used poison to hunt and fight for life in the ocean. They would have looked exactly like the olive sea snake. If you ask me, that's anything but a mighty sea beast that used to terrify sailors for hundreds of years. So, could evolution have been more lenient with terrestrial dragons? It looks like they could have been the only privileged species to save face. Terrestrial dragons would have walked on four legs and been the largest of modern lizards. These animals would have lived in deserts where they could still spew fire and make use of their razor-sharp teeth. If dragons hadn't become the top predators, they would have surely been dangerous hunters. They would have fed on medium-sized mammals and perhaps even attacked people just like modern Komodo dragons. It seems that in the imagination of our ancestors, dragons looked much more majestic than they do through prism of science. But what if I tell you that despite all I've just said, you still have a chance to meet a real dragon? One of them lives in the tropics and has a more breathtaking appearance than any fictional monster. 
Its body is long and blue with two pairs of feet on each side, and its front feet resemble wings that branch out into finger-like serrata. The rear feet are a bit smaller, but have appendages connected to the digestive tract. Next to the dragon's mouth, there are tentacles that help it capture prey. This animal can wait for a victim for hours, looking in water so skillfully that nobody would ever notice it. This fearsome beast, this blue sea dragon, is a tiny mollusk measuring no more than 40 millimeters. Would you like to run into it if it were hundreds of times larger?